Hello, and welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we are talking about something that has touched almost all law students, HEST anxiety. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience, so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, the Catapult Conference, and the Trebuchet Legal Careers site. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we're talking about every law student's favorite topic, test anxiety. Okay, maybe it's not really anyone's favorite topic, but it's a really important one because it seems that almost every law student in some capacity ends up having to deal with this during law school or the bar exam. I mean, I know for me, I mean, if you told me before law school I would have test anxiety, I was like, what? No way. That's not me. Like, that would never happen because I had no experience with it, like literally ever. And I remember the first... um, law school exam, which luckily was sort of this like practice test for this class that was ungraded. Um, And I prepared for it. I'd done the reading. I'd actually like prepared for the exam, which no one did in this class because no one cared about it. Um, And ironically, that probably caused my problem. Um, But I went in and I got the test and I read it and it was kind of like, okay, I think I know where I'm going with this. Like, whatever. I'm going to get up and go to the bathroom before I start writing. And I came back and I looked at this blank screen and it was like my mind went as blank as that screen. Mm -hmm. And I started, I was sitting there, I was like, oh my God, I don't know what to start writing. I don't know what to do. Oh my God. And I basically totally lost it um, (laughs) and ended up failing the exam actually. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and it was just totally new experience, but it really made me realize like I needed to have some tools and some strategies to deal with that. And I think the law school situation is set up differently than most of our previous academic experiences with the one big test. So we're really not used to preparing for multiple one big tests. You know, it's not, it's like maybe you prepared for the SAT or you prepared for the LSAT, but it's like law school exams feel like four of those. In- also the LSAT or the SAT, you know, you can just get a do over. Right. That's very you know, true. Like thing, you know, I had certain times I took the SAT and things just didn't go well and I just took it again. Yeah, that's very true. I think for me, um, the test anxiety, I didn't have a blank out um, experience in law school. I was pretty good until um, I had computer problems start happening, uh, which happened to me my second semester. I had a string of multiple exams during an exam period where my computer combusted with the software that they were running, I know. And that really did kind of make me so nervous. And I had to make some judgment calls, you know, in the moment of whether or not I was going to try and pass the class (laughs) because you did get it, you know, it was really felt that dire. I think for me, the anxiety um, around test taking really ranched it up for the bar exam. Um, but that's its own podcast topic. Um, but no matter what, I think everybody experiences anxiety around test taking in a different way than they did um, before law school. Yeah, I, I just think the stakes are higher and it's just a more high pressure, high stress situation. Yeah. So before we dive into what we can do to deal with and cope with this anxiety, I think we should take a few minutes to talk briefly about what happens to our bodies when we're in these exam situations and what will cause um, you to black out, basically. (laughs) Well, you're saying this is like a bodily thing? Apparently. like my brain? No. So we are not experts at all on this topic, but luckily we have friends who have um, told us what happens and we uh, want to share some of those details with you. So when it comes down to it, it turns out that stress really isn't all that bad because biologically stress is what is designed to protect us, uh, not from law school exams, but from things like running into dangerous wild animals uh, as we leave our huts. But when we feel stress, our body is flooded with stress hormones like adrenaline, which you've likely heard of and have experienced. And that is what would help us run or fight if we needed to, if we were still living in the wild. But your body... um, in order to do that, it takes all the resources can- it can to feed this fight or flight response. So it's pretty amazing. You know, that's why people feel like they can run faster than they ever have or do something really powerful when, you know, your body just takes all of its energy, sends it to whatever 
response you need to stay safe and you know gets you out of a bad situation problem is this fight or flight response doesn't work so well with us when we're dealing in an, with an academic environment or taking an exam because when our bodies divert resources to help us with our fight or flight response our brain doesn't actually function that well and then we do things like blackout or blank on a law school exam forget huh. everything you learned don't know what to write things like that that's very interesting it is very interesting um you know, That's take- probably why I wanted to just run out of the room at that moment. <laughs> exactly. See, you had a true fight or flight response. <laughs> yes, I decided to stay and fight. But yes. I really wanted to take flight. Yes. But taking a law school exam isn't as stressful as, say, you know, seeing a lion when we get out of bed in the morning. But unfortunately, our bodies can't really tell the difference between being scared of the lion and being scared of the exam. We basically have the same physical uh, and mental reaction. So um, adrenaline can really work against us in law school exams, but I don't necessarily think that means that all adrenaline is bad because I know for me, I need a little adrenaline to be very focused um, and work effectively. I have called it finding the good fear. I just Mm -hmm. need enough fear to really be in the zone, but not so much fear that I black out. Um, when right, across- I mean, exactly. It's like you want to have that little bit of like extra energy and focus when you're getting ready to start the exam because you kind of need that to make sure that you get through the next three or four hours at top, you know, performance. Yep. Um, yeah, I know we should we'll talk later about the podcast we did with Dr. Weisinger about pressure because he has some really interesting stuff to say about this. Yeah. The really the problem with the adrenaline is when it crosses that line and it basically paralyzes you. You know, that's where you're not able to perform at your best. And then a student calls us and says, you know, I completely blanked out or I, you know, should have walked out of the exam or I didn't know what happened or they threw out all of their test taking strategies out of the window. All of that stuff is because the adrenaline really went over that line. So that's basically what happens to your body when you freak out in a law school exam. (laughs) Yeah, which is not, I mean, from anyone who's had that experience, it is definitely not a pleasant experience. No. Um, and I think one of the key things to think about here is some of the stuff, you know, it can happen if it's never happened to you before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, definitely you want to develop some techniques and things. But I think for some people, if you know this is a recurring problem, and one of the things Dr. Weisinger said that was interesting, he's like, it's not like test anxiety is actually necessarily that different from regular anxiety. If you suffer from regular anxiety, it's just heightened on a test. We call mm-hmm. it test anxiety. He's like, for a lot of people... They actually need help with the underlying anxiety, yeah. not so much, you know, like, yeah, great. You know, we can talk about different techniques for calming yourself down in an exam and that kind of thing. But it's like, if this is a real problem and it's consistently been a problem. You need to look at other solutions besides just like the test part of it. And maybe those solutions, if you're, you know, not yet in law school, you want to explore before law school. You know, if you have struggled with anxiety or testing anxiety in some capacity before law school, typically it's going to get worse in law school. Yeah. I mean, everything, everything bad is probably going to get worse. In law school. I mean, <laughs> that true. sounds depressing, but it's just like, you know, it's just a much higher stakes, higher pressure situation. So these things that maybe you could deal with when the competition wasn't as tough, you know, you can't deal with as easily when you're competing with a higher caliber person, which mm-hmm. is the reality of the law school curve or people have never experienced the curve before. So, you know, that alone People spend a lot of mental energy, like worrying about where they're going to be on the curve. And I think that's one of the things you can do sort of globally to help with some of this like stress and anxiety. It's just understand. And, you know, this is a sort of fundamental understanding is you don't control the outcome here. Mm -hmm. You know, like you don't control what grade you get. You actually literally have no control over that. You can write the most amazing, perfect essay response on earth and someone might still do a better job. Mm hmm. That's just the way it is. You don't control your grade. What you can control is the amount of effort you're putting in, like how prepared you are and how you, you know, the techniques and things that you're using on the exam to make sure you're performing as well as you possibly can. But I think once you make that shift from understanding, like I control the input, but I don't control the output, it can alleviate some of the stress of like, I have to get an A, I have to get an A. It's like, that's out of your hands. Yeah, that's very true. And I think it's a hard thing to release. Oh, um, really? I'm not saying of. this is easy. No, <laughs> none of this stuff is easy. I mean, uh, you know, my anxiety pressure point myself is around the medical profession. 
So I'd like, I save it for that very specific <laughs> part of my <laughs> life. But, um, but I mean, that's something I constantly struggle with. I mean, this stuff, it's a constant battle. You know, and we recognize that, but ignoring the battle just isn't going to do you any good. Well, or just thinking you can power through it. Yes. You know, that you can just ignore the sensation that you're feeling in your body when you think about taking an exam. And that sensation is like, you know, your stomach clenches and mm -hmm. your your hands get cold and you start sweating. And you're like, oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm good. I'm not worried. I'm 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 strong. I'm like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not going to help. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, signs, it sounds kind of like woo-woo to people who are not in California. But, you know, one of the thing, first things that you do when you start studying mindfulness, which I know you've done some mindfulness mm -hmm. for lawyers classes with Judy Cohen at Warrior One. And, you know, one of the first things you do is really tune into that physical sensation yeah. and not push it away. Um, because what that helps you do is realize, like, it doesn't have to, like, it's not going to, A, it's not going to kill you, mm -hmm. um, you know, and like, yeah, maybe it's scary to feel like, oh, wow, I feel really, like, tense or stressed. But then you just kind of observe it with curiosity. And it becomes this thing that, like, it just is what it is. Yeah. And it's not more than that. Yeah, that's very, very true. So let's talk about maybe some of these ways that we can cope. Um, just overall or things that have worked for us or recommendations we have um, learned about kind of in the moment. So I think the first one for me, and one thing I always raise with students when they talk to me about test anxiety is stress and anxiety are always managed better when you are healthy and taking care of yourself, which is always such a bummer because all I want to do when I'm stressed and have anxiety is eat sugar and drink caffeine. And probably drink alcohol. <laughs> and so drink alcohol, Forget too. that you're stressed. So that's, that's true. Like, that's like the classic. Uh, I've been breastfeeding too long. I, I've, I've Like, uh, alcohol isn't on my list anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the, kind of the classic trilogy in law school is like crappy food, too much caffeine, and too much alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, and it's going to make everything harder to deal with. And so, like, the first thing you kind of need to do is take care of yourself and sleep. That's another one that oh, yeah, people often... Oh, definitely. I mean, we've talked to people all the time. And so you'll kind of have this roundabout conversation. And then at some point, they're like, yeah, and I just can't really focus very well when I'm reading in the library. And suddenly I have this moment of, like, how much sleep are you getting? You know, and when the answer is like, oh, four or five hours a night. It's like, yep, that needs to change. Yeah, that's not enough. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> No. And I think people forget that anxiety and stress compounds over time. You know, your this fight or flight response, if you're constantly in this um, zone of being anxious about little things or stressed, it makes your true adrenaline response, you know, a much greater overreaction. And so if you have been kind of a stress ball mess all semester, s exams are going to be worse. Well, and it's also you can sort of see this in most people's own personal lives where, you know, you're starting to get a little bit stressed, like maybe you're eating a little less well, you're not getting quite as much exercise, you're sleeping a little bit less well, and suddenly you start snapping at everyone around you. Mm -hmm. And then what does that cycle turn into? You're snapping <laughs> back and then you're more stressed out and then your relationship is falling apart. Um, and it's just the reality that, you know, we have a limited amount of willpower. Yeah. So if you're like physically drained i mean you see this with new parents all the time they're like i'm just so tired yeah that i realize like everything upsets me now yeah and that's not a great place to be no no nope so it's something that you really just want to be aware of and kind of check yourself throughout the entire semester because it's going well, to make it harder and it's just something to take seriously and try to get a handle on like it's mm -hmm. not you're not doing yourself a favor if you're like oh, I'm just going to ignore, like, the stress or I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist because I'm strong and I can deal with it. Like, you're not doing yourself any favors because it's just going to get worse. No, Allison and I are both very strong people. And we have all, <laughs> <laughs> both of us, have run into, you know, times of super stress, anxiety when we are not at our best. I mean, that's, and I consider us both to be pretty strong, successful people. Yeah, but, you know, it's just like everybody gets pushed to a point. And people yep. have different, you know, people do have different points. Like you have a different set point of like what you can handle. Yeah. Um, things that would really upset one person, another person is just going to roll off their back. Yeah. And But, you know, lawyers on the whole, there's a reason that as a profession, they have massive like drinking problems and depression and things like that. And it's because there is this culture of just sort of powering through. Mm-hmm. When in reality, you can actually learn a bunch of coping mechanisms that people have been doing for oh, thousands of years now. Yeah. 
that really tend to work, actually. It's true. And so that's a great transition. Maybe we should start talking about some of them. <laughs> so um, what are some of your favorite coping mechanisms that you've used in the past? Well, I mean, I have to say I didn't use any of these in law school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it literally took, well, that's actually not true. So my story is I went into law school being like this very like type A overachiever, everything's good. I'm never going to show, never show weakness. You know, nothing ever bothers me. I can cope with all of it. Um, and ended up getting clinically depressed my second semester and landed in therapy, which was probably the best choice I've ever made. And, you know, my therapist would sort of sit and say, well, I'd tell her some crazy story about like everything that's going on and, you know, my life as a law student. She'd say, well, how does that make you feel? And I was like, I don't really understand the question. Could you rephrase that? (laughs) (laughs) And she's like, yeah, what are you feeling as you tell me this story about like totally bombing when you got called on in SimPro? And I was like, well, I think that the problem was like, I just didn't understand the question. She's like, that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you like, what are you feeling about this situation? And it was really like, it was a total revolution. I was just like, huh, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, the first step for me was literally like, actually noticing what was going on and then later i you know randomly picked up some book from pema chandran on like meditating and was like wow this is really interesting and sort of started doing these exercises about you know tuning into like the sensation you're feeling if you're starting to feel stressed out and dropping the storyline about the story that you're telling yourself about like oh i'm so stupid like how could i have done that like i'm such an idiot i'm gonna flunk out of law school you know there i mean we all do this, mm-hmm. um, but that you know that book, which uh, I think it was called "The Places That Scare You." I'll put it in the show notes. Was really a total revelation, and it's actually a nice book. Like you can just read it. I literally read it every night in law school for like ten or fifteen minutes until the ambient kicked in. And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah. you know I have friends who um, have done. I also didn't really wasn't really into meditation although i'd read some buddhism and things like that um before law school but i have a lot of friends who you know have been introduced to some of these coping mechanisms in different ways either through yoga or through meditation or mantras or going to a retreat or whatever it might be and i think what's key is to just kind of experiment with some of them to what resonates for you you know whether it be reading you know, a book like this before bed or doing, you know, a five minute seated meditation or just having mantras you say to yourself to be kind to yourself when you're all of a sudden not being kind to yourself. And right. um, I think what I, I think sometimes people get discouraged about is feeling there's only one way to, um, to learn about this stuff and, and practice it. And there really isn't. Yeah, it's like very you're not doing like a 30 minute seated, med- seated meditation every single day, right. like on your fancy cushion, your failure. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I hate meditating like that. I think you do too. Yeah, I do. Um, but I recognize the value. I, mm-hmm. I aspire to that. But, you know, I mean, even Elizabeth Gilbert admitted recently she hasn't meditated for a year. Or so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she wrote Eat, Late, Eat, Pray, Love. <laughs> exactly. So, it, but it's good to just, um, Try out these things, you know, and I think some people feel like, okay, well, I don't want to try out a book. I mean, there are apps um, that can help you. I think the Headspace app is one of them that's very um, helpful and I've definitely used before where you it can kind of help you facilitate um, working on meditation. But I think the biggest point to this is it's worth learning or exposing yourself a bit to and trying to practice it. Because the problem is if you don't practice this stuff, it can be very hard to call on it in the moment of stress. Yeah. I mean, you need to be prepared before. Yeah. I and mean, one of the things I really like for people to sort of try out when they're getting started um, are these guided meditations. So it's mm-hmm. not just that you're sitting there like listening to like bells tingling in the background and he's sitting there saying don't think don't think don't think <laughs> <laughs> you know, which, i mean you know once you know that you know once you practice this you can actually do that but for, i don't think it's realistic necessarily to drop someone into this thing and be like okay now just sit there and like don't think about anything right um I mean, like for me for example when i had a surgery which was unexpected because i stabbed myself in the finger and severed a tendon and i was terrified like i'd never had surgery I was really upset about this whole situation to begin with. I felt really stupid for having done this. Um, Also, like, I was misdiagnosed. Like, there was all this stuff. And it was, like, basically an emergency surgery at that point. Um, 
And a friend of mine who had had cancer sent me these guided meditations, which I've now sent to like all these other people because they're amazing. Um, You know, and it's literally like 10 minutes of them kind of walking you through this whole process. And then you have your team like on your, and the first time that I listened to this, I was totally hysterical. Like I, because it gets at all these sort of like fear places Mm -hmm. Um, and it really like brings them out. And I was like sobbing hysterically because it was so scary. This, they're walking me through this whole thing and I've got to go into surgery and I'm like, ah, I don't want to go into surgery. Um, But like the second or the third time I listened to it, it was actually super calming. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I went in, I was very calm about the whole situation. And so, you know, an exam can kind of be like that too. Like, you don't want to think about it, but it's that not thinking about it that also like causes a lot of the stress that you, once you get it out, you can approach it in a more like reasonable, like calm manner. It's very true. I did some hypnobirth training when wow, I that was. that sounds so hippie. It I'm is sorry. so <laughs> hippie. It is so hippie. But um, and again, it was one of those things where you take with it, take from it what you want. But it. Birth is another thing that, you know, it's like this, it, it's going to happen, you know. <laughs> right, it's inevitable. <laughs> and you try and prepare for it. Um, and you try and, you know, mentally prepare yourself for what you're going to do when that stressful situation kicks in. And it's the, along the same lines. I mean, that's, what, that's why what's so interesting about this stuff for, from my perspective is it's very transferable, these skills. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm listening to the hypnobirth guided meditations going, wow, these sound a lot like other guided meditations I've done. They're just around birth or yours was just around surgery. Right. No, the surgery, I was like, wow, we should really have this for our law students. I know. Just about exams. It's still on our list. Don't worry, guys. We're working on it. But, um, you know, so I think it is interesting. And in the moment when I was having my baby, I didn't like think about all of the guided meditations I'd done. But Because I had thought about it and I had kind of mentally prepared for it as much as you can mentally prepare for that, there were things I could call on or somebody could, you know, mention something to me and it, and it meant, and I went, oh, I know I'm, I can think about it this way or I can change the way I'm physically reacting or things like that because I'd practiced. And I think that that to me is what I learned so much from that experience was you can prepare and practice to be mentally ready, even for a situation where things aren't exactly what they seem, which for me, I mean, birth are a bunch of sensations you haven't had before, most of us, unless you've done it multiple <laughs> times. And so you've got to be ready to like roll with the benches. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I think it was the same thing, you know, this Pema Chandran book, basically what it's teaching is like Tonglen meditation. And like really the heart of that is just like you breathe in kind of like the bad, like heavy stuff. And then you breathe out sort of like lighter relaxation. And I do that all the time. It's like anytime you're in like a crazy situation where you're like starting to sort of spiral and like get really stressed out, like you can just take a few breaths like that. And suddenly, Mm -hmm. you know, it does call on all this other stuff where you then start to relax and you can think more clearly. Um, I think one of our friends who does uh, anxiety and bar stuff describes it almost like a snow globe, Mm -hmm. you know, so those things that like you shake up as a kid and there's snowfalls and you can't really see anything. She's like, that's the state that you're in. But if you can just sort of like set the snow globe down or take a few deep breaths and, you know, go to your happy place Mm -hmm. um, and then the snow settles and you can go on about whatever it is that you're doing or you can see the scene, you know, so it's but the problem is if you keep shaking it, it's never going to settle down. That's true. And I love that you just mentioned something as easy as just taking a deep breath, because one of the things I am constantly checking in with myself about is especially when I get stressed or annoyed about something, is I literally take short, very shallow breaths, which is what most of us do. Yeah, and, exactly. And that actually feeds um, stress and anxiety. And so if you actually take a moment to just say, I'm going to take a deep breath, you might be shocked at how you realize you have not been breathing. <laughs> yes. And if you're not breathing, you're not really getting good quality oxygen and your brain isn't working as well as it could be. Yep. So Even something as simple as taking a deep breath can really help you check in with yourself and will, it actually will create a physiological response of calming the body. Yeah, And I think you want to have prepared and ideally practice some of these techniques before you go into a law school exam. So, because the point is they need to be almost second nature. Yeah. 
Um, because like, you know, you might remember like, oh yeah, Lee and Allison were talking about taking a deep breath. Like, what was I supposed to do with that? But, you know, when you're taking your practice exam, and this is a great reason to take practice exams under conditions that are as close as possible to your real exams, you know, so maybe you take it in a coffee shop where there's noise around you or whatever, um, is it trains you to know that you can survive that situation. And so, you know, being more familiar, I mean, the more anxiety you know you have, I think the more practice tests you need to be taking. And and then in those tests, you can actually practice these techniques and really pay attention to what's going on with you so that in the real exam, you don't run screaming from the room. Yeah, I think that's (laughs) very, very true. And um, most people don't practice them in the practice exams, which is such a an awful mistake to make. And I would say that a certain portion of the student population, especially those who may have extended time for various reasons, either um, some sort of learning disability or an anxiety issue, or there are a whole multitude of reasons or a physical disability why you end up needing extra time. Um, I've had a lot of students who work with that extra time really give themselves part of that time to do coping mechanisms. Um, And it makes a huge difference for them. I actually had one student who struggled with ADD and she built in full on five minute meditations into her exam time. And because it was really the only thing she had tried that would really get her back. Like, Like she you know, it calmed things down, settled the snow globe, <laughs> and she was able to, you know, see clearly again. And she just knew that that's what she needed to do to be able to see clearly again. So that's how she planned her exam time. That's what she needed to do to be successful. And But she wouldn't have even known that if she had not practiced doing it in all of her practice exams. Yeah, and I think it could even be sim- something as simple as, like, every time you take a bathroom break or something, you actually – you know, you do a little bit of deep breathing, whether it's just 10 breaths or whatever, or, you know, you take a few minutes to actually like focus your mind and to track, you know, kind of uh, like disengage from the exam and just like let your brain rest for a second. Mm-hmm. Like it's only a few minutes and you're already going to the bathroom. So what difference does it make? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not very like wasting true. time. <laughs> it's very true. But, you know, if you have read some books and you've tried deep breathing and nothing seems to be working, it is really time to call a therapist or a doctor. Or both. Or both. Um, and explore options with an expert. Uh, and yeah, there are... The reality is there's so many people who deal with these sort of problems and there's so many different people who can potentially help you mm-hmm. that if you're not reaching out and like asking for that help, you're just not doing yourself any favors. No. And it's not just traditional therapy. Um, a lot of people are interested in hypnotherapy, which is a bit like guided meditations. Uh, my sister loves that. She yeah. said it was life-changing. Yeah. And so, um, you know, exploring that. And that I mean, can be done on the phone, apparently. Oh, that is really interesting. Yeah. She has a, my sister's uh, got a hip, had a hypnotherapist in like LA or something. Yeah. And there are hypnotherapists. I know one in the Bay Area who has worked with people who are studying for the bar and things like that. So they're even familiar with dealing with these issues. Um, but again, it takes a little time. You can't, you know, call the hypnotherapist the day before the exam and say, I'm freaking (laughs) out. What are you going to do? But again, if this is something you've been struggling with, think ahead and reach out to experts. We should also mention that if you're new to law school, most law schools will pay for therapy. Yeah. Which is a great thing to take advantage of. Even if you think you're fine, they can always probably provide you better coping mechanisms. Yeah. So it's really good to use the resources available to you. Um, people also might want to listen to the uh, podcast we did with Dr. Weisinger on pressure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he has a book that's basically performing under performing your best under pressure or something like that. And his argument, which I think is probably right, is that actually no one really steps up into the pressure. You know, people think like, oh, I perform great under pressure. He's like, it's actually just the people who can keep it together and lose it less. Mm-hmm. He's like, no one, you know, from athletes to people taking exams no one is actually performing their best when they're under pressure and it's just a question of like can you keep it together more than the person sitting beside you who's Mm -hmm. totally falling apart yeah i think that that's a really good point and the fact that when you have that fight or flight response you know and you want to run out of the room like calzen was talking about during her practice exam or her first exam that you don't, you don't. Like you sit there and you are actually still working through it. And it's all about um, being in the moment and doing your best in the circumstances you have. Coping as best as you can, but it's happening in that moment. You can't just say like, time out. I'm going to go take an hour 
and regroup and come back. That's not, you don't have that option. So you really do have to learn how to make the most of the situation you've been given because it's happening at that moment. Yeah. And I think that's one of the good things about learning some stuff about meditation is it is, you know, you basically start to realize like this sensation. Yes, it is unpleasant. I don't enjoy this, but it's not going to kill me. Yeah. And the more of those that you do, you know, the more you can kind of get through and be like, okay, I recognize that I'm having like a stressed out reaction here. My mind has gone blank. I know that this will pass if I can just like, you know, calm down a little bit. Yeah. And part of that's about the language that we use. You know, most people are really hard on themselves, particularly people who end up in law school. And that's just not necessarily very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, because we believe these stories we tell ourselves about, you know, whether we feel like we're stupid or we can't do it or we're not qualified or somebody else is better. Um, We talk about that that a lot when we talk about mindset, which can be very important. But in the moment, you know, when we tell ourselves we can't do this, we're going to fail. Those are self-fulfilling prophecies. They have a huge effect on how we perform. Yeah. If you're looking around the room, you're like, oh, my God, everybody else is writing faster than I am. They're going to do better. Yeah, that's the tension that you're not focusing on getting your exam written. Yeah. Yeah. So. So if you've gotten to this point in the podcast and you think that Allison and I are totally woohoo, hippy dippy, (laughs) Bay Area people who do things like hypnobirth and guided meditations, um, I do want to make one more, um, more and more plea to really consider these breathing exercises and the power of them which is that I read an article a while back and they were talking about that um, the military actually teaches breathing techniques to calm the nerves of um, very elite soldiers, especially snipers. Um, Because in battle situations, which are going to be more stressful than law school, (laughs) let's be honest, (laughs) um, snipers especially have to calm their body because they... I mean, they're working with precision, right? They have to have clear minds and they can't have, say, shaky hands, right? Right. Well, it's kind of like that um, Olympic sport, the crazy one where they make you cross-country ski and then shoot a gun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to remember what that's called. Biathlon, I think. Biathlon. I think you're um, right. But I think the people who, who do best at it are actually the ones who are most quickly able to calm their breathing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's it's, it's a, it has a huge... Um, impact on how we can perform physically and mentally so 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 what are these snipers doing okay well first of all they don't the military apparently does not call it you know guided meditations or (laughs) anything like that they call it tactical breathing which sounds sounds very military um but it allows them to rapidly regain control of their body and so this is what it looks like based on what the internet research that i had did after reading about this so you inhale through your nose deeply expanding your stomach for a count of four And then you hold that breath for four counts. And then you exhale through your mouth, completely contracting your stomach for the count of four. And then you hold the empty breath for a count of four. And they recommend you do it at least four times. Now, I totally have done something like this in my yoga class. I was going to say, this you? sounds exactly yeah. like yoga. But, but it's, Except there, I think you're also like going through one nostril or something. Yes, I know. I do that a lot uh, in my yoga class, which would be a little more awkward, I guess, in, a, in yeah. an exam if you're holding your nostrils. But... The tactical breathing, so that's what it is. And I think it's very interesting um, that they have, you know, the military has definitely spent some time looking into this, you realize. Yeah, they, they're not just like, oh, yeah, woo-woo, sounds good. Right. So the fact that something as simple like that um, can be called on by folks in extreme situations where you can only imagine that the flight or fight response is about as intense as it can be. And um, with very good reason. With very good reason, I think is pretty powerful. So whether or not you use this tactical breathing method or something you've done in a yoga class or you take our advice and check out some guided meditations, all of these skills can really help you cope in the moment and make testing anxiety something that just is something you deal with and not something that prevents you from performing your best. Well, and let's just make the final point that it's not like the pressure and the stress goes away when you become a lawyer. Mm-hmm. You know, it's true. Like the, the class that you did was with a bunch of lawyers who all realized that they need some better coping mechanisms to be able to do their jobs. Yes, for sure. Because the stress levels of lawyers... And the unhappiness levels of lawyers is so high. Um, and you can use some of these techniques to, you know, manage just anxiety that comes up in the workplace. I know in one of our classes, they were talking about, um, you know, the 
the adrenaline or the anger that comes up when you get like the phone call from opposing counsel. You know, oh, we have oh. caller ID, right? And that you know that it's going to be bad. And the power of doing a breathing exercise before you pick up the phone or setting an intention before you pick up the phone to yeah. tar- tone down your response. And that that can make a huge difference. I mean, people in our class talked about how in practice, um, especially those who practiced criminal law and family law, where oh, you know, God, you can only imagine where they can be really, really hostile. It had a it had a big effect. So this stuff, if you start working on it now, is something that you can really use as a life skill going forward. And we are definitely not perfect. We are all a work in progress. And still <laughs> gaining work in, new work skills. In progress. All I got time. a really nice. Uh, cute meditation cushion which i'm glad that the color i got matches a painting in my room because i think i've used it like once <laughs> nice but, was that after yeah. you went on that retreat it might have been after my eslin trip that's really yeah, yeah. Um, all right well unfortunately with that i can't talk about any more about eslin although it's awesome if you ever have a chance to go because we are out of time <laughs> If you enjoyed this episode of our podcast, please take a second to leave a review or rating on iTunes. We would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. Typically, our episodes come out on Mondays. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or Allison at allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening. We'll talk soon and we'll put some of these resources in the show notes.